Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the PowerShell and DevOps uh, Summit. It's nice uh, to see so many people here early in the morning. It was uh, definitely a struggle for me this morning, so uh, bear with me if I look a bit, uh, a bit sleepy. Uh, so today we're going to go into uh, elevating your scripts and we're going to talk about uh, advanced functions and parameter techniques. It's uh, going to be a bit of a different uh, session as the normal ones as it's, uh, as it's a workshop. So we'll try to keep it as interactive as possible because if you guys need to hear me for just three and a half hours, it's going to, uh, it's going to be a long, uh, long haul for all of us. So let's, uh, let's see if we can make it uh, uh, yep. uh, as applicable uh, as possible for everyone. So first, uh, first of all, a big thank you to our uh, to our sponsors. Uh, if you haven't seen them yet, they're set up in the hallway. Um, you can say thank you, or you can go over and get some swag. They won't give you a second one. Just tell them Yap said you can have two. So <laughs> your mileage uh, might vary, but let's see how that goes. Uh, most important thing, uh, Wi-Fi, of course. It was also at the entrance, but uh, paying attention is hard. I missed it the first time, so here's the Wi-Fi in case, uh, in case you need it. And with that, let's not talk too much about me. My name is Jaap. I do things on Twitter. Uh, I've been here a couple of times already, so I see some familiar faces in the audience. Just to get an idea for the people uh, here, for how many of you is it uh, your first time here? Oh wow, that's uh, yeah for uh, that's eighty percent. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, to get an idea, how many how many years have you been using PowerShell? I'll just uh, start saying numbers. And if you have you been using PowerShell for one year, uh, at least one year, at least two years, three years, four years, five years, six, seven, eight. All right. Pretty advanced. I'm gonna stop here because otherwise I'll keep on counting. And to be honest, I also kind of forgot when uh, 2006 it came out. Am I right? Yeah, I see some some nodding. So, I mean, for the recording, people can't see, so I can just always pretend that I'm right. That's uh, <laughs> sweet. Uh, yeah, to give you a bit of an idea of uh, what I have from a content uh, uh, point of view, uh, we have the welcome that we're going to uh, now. Uh, we'll go cover some of the PowerShell basics just to make sure that uh, everyone who is in the room uh, is, at the is at the same level. Um, since, mo uh, since a lot of you have a lot of experience with PowerShell already, we'll just quickly go to it just to make sure that uh, everyone is at the right level. Um, then we'll talk about uh, PowerShell functions, how we can implement them, why we, can impl uh, uh, why we want to implement them, and what kind of components are there. Uh, then we'll go into advanced functions uh, in combination with uh, some parameters. Um, then we also have sections for error handling and use cases. Um, so that is uh, the general, general outline of what we have from a content point of view. Um, did anyone here come with a specific question or a specific issue uh, that they would like to solve? Uh, because we will have time for that near the, near the end as well. So we can just dive into uh, a specific, uh, specific issue that uh, someone is having. So is that, oh yeah, before uh, I move on, is that aligned with what people are here for? Yeah, it sounds good. Well, it sounds good so far. You've just heard me talk for five minutes so far. We're going to, uh, we're going to keep on going for a while. Cool. So three and a half hours with a half hour break. The break is uh, like in one and a half hours, if I'm not mistaken. Um, for everyone here, since I don't uh, want to hear myself talk uh, the entire time, uh, can you introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you? If you already know each other, just pretend and just mumble. I can't hear what you're saying any, anyway. <laughs> um, because, we have a, because we have a small room with, uh, with uh, well, not, not a small audience, but a, a decent sized audience. Uh, I would like to encourage you to interrupt me whenever you disagree with something or you want to know more about the topic, raise your hand or just shout Jaap, that's, that's my name. 
Um, I, I say minimal slides. Uh, well, the total slide number is there. It might or might not be uh, might or might not be accurate. We'll go into uh, more code than slides. That's definitely uh, that's definitely the the challenge and uh, the, the the intention. And everything uh, will be online afterwards and uploaded. So uh, for any of the code samples, you don't need to uh, you don't need to take uh, you don't need to take photos. The idea is also when I uh, when I'm showing certain uh, certain samples, and it's something that uh, you have encountered or uh, you're, you're struggling with, or you have a different kind of implementation, uh, raise your hand. I will be happy to uh, answer any questions or to clarify further what uh, what what the intention is or how how we can do things better. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so the topics, uh, we have some slides to explain the, the basic concepts. We have examples to show uh, functionality. I try to make it uh, as closely related to real-world uh, examples. Uh, we'll end up with a bunch of uh, real-world uh, examples as well. If you have any specific samples that you would like me to take a look at, uh, that's, that's always uh, a, a, a more, uh, what's the word for it, uh, a more exciting one to get some uh, some live samples from the audience. Doesn't always work out great, and sometimes the samples are better than my code, well, usually. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah, those are the questions. Uh, what, what kind of things are you struggling with? Uh, what kind of uh, project are you proud of? These are questions that you can, can think of now. We'll get back to that uh, later on uh, in the session, in the second, uh, in the second part. Uh, the third one I would like to know, how many of you are already uh, writing PowerShell functions? All right, excellent. That's uh, a pretty good uh, number. So yeah, then the basics should be, uh, should be familiar as well. Verb, sing singular noun, so don't use plural. If you do use plural, uh, Nowadays in VS Code, uh, you will get a squiggly line uh, if you don't use approved verbs. But I've seen it uh, quite often when it just comes up with, uh, with verbs, uh, with plural verbs. Uh, I like to do the same with my, uh, with my variables as well, because the amount of time where I have server and servers and then do a for each to, uh, to go to it, and I mistype it or I uh, I turn it around and then my skit doesn't work the way I expected or I'm using a wrong variable. Uh, happened too many times and waste half a day trying to uh, troubleshoot that. So I always try to make it as clear as possible for myself uh, because I, I failed way too many times. Uh, whenever I don't know, uh, get help, get command, get member, uh, the, the usual sus suspects to uh, to get to the bottom of why something isn't working. Uh, yeah, the, the, imp the important thing is uh, understanding that uh, when you're working with, uh, with PowerShell, you're working with objects, and those objects always have properties, and th they might not always be the properties you expect them uh, to be. A good example of that is if you've ever used get process, the default output of get process, if you then try to select those properties, those properties uh, won't exist because they're actually just display, uh, display properties. So it's, uh, it's important to, uh, to use those and to get in, uh, understand what they're, uh, what they're used for. Um, yeah, so PowerShell, Windows PowerShell, uh, what's, uh, what's going on there? Less relevant uh, nowadays because uh, how many of you are still actively using uh, Windows PowerShell? Okay, that's it. What's that? Ah, uh, yeah, customers. Yeah, o o always fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's not too long ago that I still had to write PowerShell one code because I I didn't have the authority to upgrade PowerShell on some 2003 server. So it's <laughs> it. If anyone worked with PowerShell 1, there were no modules, so good luck writing anything for, uh, for PowerShell 1. Um, yeah, it's been open sourced in 2016. What it meant uh, when it was open sourced, it was available on all platforms. Uh, it was initially called uh, PowerShell Core. It was, wasn't the best idea, but it was a very Microsoft idea because then they could rename it again. Because renaming product names is 
You know it's a good product if it had at least three renames. <laughs> we started with, uh, with uh, PWSH instead of uh, PowerShell.exe. It works on uh, all devices. Uh, I see more MacBooks in the audience. I have a MacBook as well. It, uh, yeah, it just, uh, just works. Um, yeah, it's more than just uh, a, scripting, uh, a scripting language. It's an automation framework. There's a lot of uh, components that tie into PowerShell. Um, yeah, the, uh, there's uh, PowerShell Drive, so you have the registry, you have PowerShell Drive for variables, for your functions. Um, what else do we have? We have, of course, Pester, and it's, of course, also a shell. So. Uh, that's then some of the basics. So we have uh, functions and commandlets. So question for the audience, what's the difference between a function and a commandlet? Anyone wants to uh, step up? So the answer from the audience was that uh, a function uses a function keyword and a commandlet uh, comes from a script. Uh, it's slightly more, uh, to, to be slightly more precise, it comes from a compiled module. So uh, uh, a module can uh, contain many functions, then there are still functions, but it's called a commandlet it's if it's been compiled, so if it's been written in C Sharp, for, uh, for example. And then we also have external applications, and external applications are any application that we, uh, we can execute from, uh, from PowerShell, uh, but mostly the ones that are in your, uh, in your path. So if you type ping.exe or traceroute or anything like that, those are the external uh, applications. Uh, one of the interesting things of what is, uh, what is coming up uh, this year with PowerShell 7 and what was put on the roadmap for, uh, for PowerShell is that they're going to work on improved, uh, uh, improved reliability for the exit codes and the output of external applications. So there are some, uh, there are some challenges with the external applications because anything that is called from PowerShell is of course going to be structured output and any external application is just dumb text. So then we have to parse it again and uh, there's different output streams. I, I won't bore you with that, we're not, uh, <laughs> we're not here for that one. Are you talking about the candle? Sorry? Are you talking about the candle? Because the uh, I'm not talking about uh, Crescendo, no. But that is, uh, that is an interesting, uh, uh, interesting one as well, yeah. Uh, one of the things to, uh, uh, to keep in mind, don't accept the defaults, just uh, configure PowerShell the way you want to configure it. Uh, I like oh my posh because it makes, uh, uh, it ma it makes customizing your, uh, your shell a lot easier. Uh, I used to do it myself and just write everything in my profile. This is a lot easier. You can just get a team set up and then it's going to be uniform no matter you're running uh, PowerShell from the Windows terminal, from, uh, uh, from Bash, from any kind of shell, uh, you can customize it. So if you are not using it yet, uh, this is one that uh, I enjoy using. Uh, other things to keep in mind, uh, there's aliases. So you can set up your own uh, aliases. If you use the new alias command, um, uh, it's of course only going to be there for the duration of your, uh, your console session or if you put it in a script for the duration that your script is running. So if you want to use aliases, uh, you can also set them up in your profile. So you have shorthand available uh, to run all the uh, other commands. Array indexing, anyone, to, anyone want to go for the bonus uh, question here? What is array indexing in PowerShell? So, uh, yeah, but, yeah, no, that's, that, 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 that's fair. The comment is in what context? So in any array that you, uh, you have in PowerShell, you can uh, use the square brackets and you can dive directly into, uh, into any kind of object to see what, what the, uh, the, the sub-objects of that array uh, are, and it can be multiple, uh, multiple levels deep. PowerShell profiles, uh, you can uh, customize your shell, and of course also customize uh, which modules you uh, have available using the PowerShell gallery. 
If you're not using Visual Studio Code and you're still on ISE, probably should be using it by now. And the idea of this whole session is, is to expand, uh, expand your PowerShell toolbox and to give you more tools available to write better functions and yeah, to help you be uh, more successful with anything you do uh, with PowerShell. Um, so here I took a couple of screenshots of uh, Windows PowerShell just to, uh, to kick it off to uh, to give some examples of what we uh, what we can use it for. So get host, we can get some version information about uh, the specific host that's running uh, PowerShell. Not to be confused with uh, your PowerShell uh, version, because your PowerShell version you get with PS version table. To get uh, the commands you have available, get command, I already mentioned, uh, already mentioned that one. Uh, we have all the object commandlets, so we have uh, select object, group object, where object, for each object. Uh, uh, we can also sort them using sort uh, object. Uh, right here I'm using, uh, I'm using shorthand for, uh, for that, an alias. All right. Um, let's Uh, could you repeat your question? Yes. So the question is, uh, where do the external applications uh, uh, come from that are, that are available in PowerShell? So what I'll do is I'll uh, open up VS Code. I'll just run it, and we can also check what kind of size we need. Because you're sitting in the back, is this? Uh, can you read it from there? And I'll make it white as well, that's probably a good idea. There we go, that should be better. Is that uh, good in the back? I see some nodding here, yeah. good. So the question was, what, uh, where do we get our commands uh, from? So if we do get command, we have a couple of parameters available here. So we'll take a look at what, uh, what type of commands. Uh, type, and then the applications, so those are the external applications, so where are they coming from? Is it just a uh, Windows system or is it just uh, your current path? So it is anything that is specified in your path variable. So uh, I'm on Mac OS now, uh, so anything that's in your default path that's always going to be available, that is what you'll, uh, what you'll see in here. All right, so uh, using the object commands, we can sort uh, and filter to, uh, to objects, make sure that it's displayed in uh, ways that uh, we want to uh, be able to work with it. There we go. Uh, if we want to get uh, help in PowerShell, uh, that's actually something that uh, was a lot better in Windows PowerShell compar compared to the PowerShell we're currently uh, uh, we're currently working with. So nowadays PowerShell ships uh, without help. So if you want to get access to any help, you should first run uh, update help before, your, before the help commands are uh, available, or at least the help text is available. Uh, it's also possible to uh, get, a, uh, get the help displayed in an external window. There's, a, there's some options available there. So we can, do, we can use show window this one, uh, by default, is only available in, uh, uh, in Windows PowerShell, unless you uh, install, uh, on Mac, it would be available if you install an uh, additional module for uh, graphical, graphical tools. Uh, show command is also a good way to uh, make it visible how a command uh, works, and the, the reason I like show command is because it uh, can give you a good overview of how the different parameter sets uh, operate and uh, which, com uh, which parameters are available for each of the parameter uh, sets. Because I've been, uh, I, I do occasionally struggle, especially if I'm writing my own, uh, my own functions, to get a good idea of which parameters I specified where and which ones are in uh, which, uh, which parameter set. 
Uh, there's also uh, more. So uh, more allows you to get the scrolling effect. Um, so if you have a long list that it doesn't uh, keep, on, uh, keep on going. Then we have out grid view. That's another, uh, another graphical way of uh, outputting your, uh, your data. So what we can also see is by default, it also displays the same, uh, the same properties that uh, are the default properties. So if you want to see everything here, so all the columns, you'll still have to use select, uh, select star. Uh, it can also work with pass-through. And what pass-through gives you is uh, you can filter, you can man manipulate what, uh, what you select in there. If you would uh, press OK, you would, uh, you would be able to kill or do any kind of operation, uh, operation there. So what I like about OutGrid View, if uh, uh, you want a lazy, easy interaction uh, with some kind of uh, GUI, OutGrid View can, uh, can be quite, uh, quite helpful for there and also to visualize what kind of data you're working with. So you can filter through it to see if uh, when you're piping an array to your, uh, to your function or to your script, you can, you can see what, uh, what is happening there. Um, uh, obviously, I wasn't going to run this one locally because that would kill my presentation, so. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, that is uh, that's a good addition. So, uh, what was mentioned was that you can also select multiple. Uh, you can also select multiple objects uh, directly from OutGrid View. So, in my case, I'd filtered it just to PowerPoint. But if I would, uh, if I would select uh, in combination uh, with a combination of either holding Shift or holding Control, or doing a regular expression, uh, I could also kill Word and Notepad or uh, two PowerPoint windows, but leave the third one open. Uh, those kind of options are all uh, indeed possible. Thank you. OK, OK, that's, uh, that's interesting. So I got, a, uh, I got an addition for, for the recording uh, and the people in the back. Uh, there's also a command to, uh, to limit the amount of, uh, amount of options you can put in there to just a single or to multiple. So then it w you would make it impossible to select multiple. Uh, that's an option I never used. Thank you. <laughs> I love workshops, I'm learning here. <laughs> Sweet, uh, yeah, uh, I also uh, I already mentioned there's uh, more PowerShell drives available than just, uh, than just the file system itself. We have uh, the file system, of course. On Windows, we would have the registry, the multiple re registries. All your variables are also, uh, are also available uh, as a PowerShell drive. And you can use that to, uh, I, I use that for troubleshooting when, whenever I'm, something doesn't work in my function. Uh, I can step into my function and just take a look at which variables are all defined at any, uh, at any point in time uh, using the debugger. It's, it's really good. For, for logging as well, you can just dump all your variables at any point in, uh, in your function just to get an idea of what was going on at that point in time. So it's uh, quite powerful. Also, all your functions are also de de defined there. And you can also access them and change them from there, which you can use to your benefit or yeah, use it to escalate privileges or do fun stuff. It's, uh, yeah. Also, the environment uh, variables. So you could use that to establish which external commands would be available uh, because your environment variables are also uh, defined there. Um, yeah, of course, uh, .NET. PowerShell is built on top of uh, .NET. .NET Core for uh, new PowerShell. You can use .NET directly from PowerShell. So it's, uh, it's, a cool, uh, it's a cool feature. Even .NET developers don't get that directly from, uh, 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 from a shell. So we, we have it. So it can be uh, quite a powerful way. Uh, what, in my experience, I would use .NET methods uh, most for is if a PowerShell command is very slow or you're working with extremely large, uh, large data sets and you need, to, uh, you need to accelerate how fast something runs, then it can be beneficial to use, uh, to use .NET methods to limit the amount of data you're working with, make it a smaller uh, sub-selection, use faster processes because uh, PowerShell is 
like that big army knife we saw, it can do a lot of things, but because it can do a lot of things, it can in some cases be, uh, it can, it's well, not, not very slow, but slower than I would like it to be. Uh, for those cases, uh, going directly to the .net underlying .NET types and using those to do the uh, comparisons can be quite beneficial. Something I used to do a lot more in the past, not so much anymore these days, WMI querying and getting information from, uh, from systems or my own system. Does anyone know what the current, uh, current day commandlet is for that? Yeah, perfect. Uh, was there a question or did you also want to answer? Uh, okay, cool. And it's also possible to write things directly to the clipboard. Uh, in this case, I'm using a clip, but it's also possible to, uh, uh, to use set clipboard. Uh, the difference between using clip, uh, at least on Windows, uh, the difference between using clip and set clipboard is that clip is an external application. So it just takes whatever PowerShell outputs and it takes the text, set clipboard, uh, will allow you to have the full uh, PowerShell objects or the full .NET objects. So what you can do with set clipboard is, for example, you can do a selection of, let's say, 500 files according to whatever kind of filter you set up uh, in your get child item and set them all to your clipboard so you can paste them, uh, paste them somewhere else. So. It, you can have quite rich interactions with the clipboard using, uh, using PowerShell, and it's something that uh, I, I've used it for, uh, for a lot of things, but it's not something that I've seen happen a lot uh, in the wild. Another thing you can use it for is um, if you're, um, it's a good way to explain this. For example, what I needed to do was I needed a way in the development environment to be able to log in with 2FA, but I didn't have a connection between my browser and between PowerShell. So I would have PowerShell monitor the, the clipboard and I had a janky uh, Chrome plugin that I could press and I could just take whatever token, uh, token was used in the browser. So I could just take over my Azure token and use that uh, to run all my commands in PowerShell. So there's, a, there's some fun things you can do with the clipboard that, uh, uh, that can be quite, uh, quite interesting. So in this case, uh, yep, I'm doing that, setting it all to the clipboard, and we can copy paste it uh, anywhere. So that was all the Windows PowerShell. The rest of the demos will all be running locally on my, uh, on my MacBook. So what we're going to do, we're going to go over a couple of those commands that I've already shown as well. And if you have any questions, uh, just interrupt me or raise your hand. Uh, what I've noticed so far, the people that interrupt me usually get an answer quicker. So <laughs> use that to your advantage. All right. So uh, if you're using VS Code, just to, uh, uh, not VS Code, pets. <laughs> also, also very important. I, I didn't enable that one uh, for, for this session. I just want to make sure that it wasn't, uh, <laughs> I just like having Clippy walk around. Uh, Make sure you have PowerShell. It makes it a lot easier to interact with PowerShell on, uh, on VS Code. And with that. So. You can already see we have our first error. It cannot find, uh, it cannot find get command. And here we see if we, do, uh, if we do get help for get command, uh, the reason it wasn't there is because I wrote it with three M's. Uh, uh, we can see that we get the basic information uh, about, 
uh, about get command, but we don't get any of the actual help. So if we want the actual help, we can run update help. I actually had to uninstall PowerShell and reinstall it just so I didn't have, uh, didn't have the help uh, here. And now we should be able to get uh, some better output. So we can see now uh, we get an ex actual description, synopsis, that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, another one that uh, I enjoy when using get help is the online switch. What that does, it will open up uh, the help page in, uh, in your browser because it's okay to use your console for, uh, for help, but a browser is, in my opinion, a lot better suited to actually read to documentation, to control F through it. So uh, I prefer that whenever I'm working with, uh, with help. Uh, finding, installing uh, modules, uh, find module. So let's see if the Wi-Fi is good enough that we can actually uh, find it. You can see some SQL, uh, my, well, some SQL, the, probably the best SQL uh, module that is out there, DBA tools. And installing it is also, uh, is also easily done. And as you can see, I didn't set up my installation. I didn't set up my installation uh, policy because I reset my PowerShell installation uh, so I wouldn't have get help anymore. Yeah, I'm gonna cancel out of that one. <laughs> Sweet. All right, um, yeah, so using get command, we can, uh, we can see the version of the command, what kind of, uh, what the source is. The reason uh, why this can be important, you can, uh, you can install multiple versions of the same module. Uh, when you're developing functions, uh, you might be working on multiple, function, uh, multiple versions of your module or your function as well. Uh, so using get command can also give you the insights to see uh, if a function is defined multiple times. Uh, that, can lead, uh, that can lead to issues uh, like not you not getting the output that you're expecting when you're working on your function. Uh, don't ask me how I know, but I might have wasted half a day on that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and it shows uh, four uh, properties by default. Uh, there's of course a lot more uh, information available on it. And what we can also see is where it's loaded from. So in this case, let's, um, let's just look here. Uh, so we can. So we can see that it's uh, it comes from this uh, from this source. So if we want to run this uh, run this function specifically from the Microsoft uh, Microsoft PowerShell utility, uh, we can prefix the function uh, with uh, with this and then execute it. So if there would be multiple uh, get date get date uh, functions or commandlets available you can you can choose the one that you want to uh, want to use and not waste half a day like I did um, yeah then we have uh, get date so to what uh, what do you think will happen if I run this command so we have get date I put it into a variable and I get all the information and I do select object star. So select object star, we're going to see everything. What will we see in the control when we, uh, when we run this one? Anyone have an idea? Will we see anything? Will we see nothing? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the interesting uh, thing about this one. So if you do parentheses around a, a variable definition, you can uh, both define the variable and as well output it immediately in, uh, in the console. So it's a, it's a bit of a trick, but uh, I find it quite useful whenever I'm uh, developing my code so I can immediately see if the function, uh, uh, if what is assigned to the variable is actually what I expect it to be. So we can see it also outputs it. So this is, uh, sorry that the taskbar pops up. I'm 
on an incline here. So whenever my mouse goes down, that, uh, that pops up. Um, so it's similar to using out variable uh, with, uh, with pass through. So that is, uh, that is what that does. You can also directly, uh, because we defined it now, we can also take a look at the different parameter sets that we have available there. Let's make this one bigger. So we can see there's a lot of uh, parameter set information in there. And that is why I mentioned uh, use show command instead, because show command shows you this in a lot easier and more understandable, uh, understandable way. And similar for uh, get child item, this is also, uh, this is also one that uh, has many different parameter sets. And based on, uh, based on what you're trying, uh, uh, which parameters that you want to use, uh, you can establish that using get command and show command. Sweet. So that is our, uh, our introduction, just to get everyone up to speed to some of, uh, some of the basics. Any questions before we, uh, before we move on? All right then. Then we continue uh, with a couple of slides, but before we, uh, before we get uh, into the slides, um, um, just to get an idea, how many of you have written a PowerShell module already? Excellent. Then you uh, are most likely going to be aware of uh, why we, uh, uh, what we use functions for. So functions is what we, uh, what we use to build our modules to make sure we, um, we have repeatable, repeatable building blocks that we can reuse and make our code, uh, make our code uh, reusable. So we can write a piece of code once and reuse it as many times. Um, a single uh, a function, yeah, it's not very clear, but uh, a, a function should have a single purpose. So a function should do one thing, like get date. Uh, it gets the date, it outputs the date. Uh, the idea of it is that you don't repeat yourself. Uh, my, my opinion of it is uh, don't make a function out of everything because uh, if you try to turn everything into a function, you might overcomplicate your code. But in 90% of the cases, uh, uh, using functions is, is the correct way. But don't go overboard, just like with, with everything uh, in life, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, why use uh, functions? Well, to simplify, uh, to simplify uh, development so you can make your scripts easier to understand because it's easier to understand your script when it says um, run, uh, uh, run this function. We have the output, we set it to a variable or we pipe it into the next, uh, into the next uh, part of the, uh, of the script. You can make it easier to understand, and you make it easier to, uh, to read, and you encourage reusability of your code. Because if you have that function, you can just plop it down in a module, and you don't have to copy paste that same piece of code over if you're writing a similar, uh, a, a similar um, piece of code or something that might need to make use of that. So the syntax of a function, uh, we start off with function, the name of the function, already mentioned how that should be formatted, and then uh, the function block. So that's anything between the, oh, what's it called, the curly, uh, the curly braces, the script, uh, the script block. When we have uh, parameters, uh, it can either be a switch parameter. So a switch parameter is kinda like a Boolean, but not truly a Boolean. So it's either uh, a switch parameter is uh, for example, dash force in get uh, get child item or in remove item. Uh, it has three states. It can either be absent, so not specified, which in most cases is similar to being uh, to being false. Uh, you can specify it, 
and how it's different from a Boolean is if you do dash force, you don't have to say it's true because it's present. And you can also specifically uh, specify it to be false. And if you want to do that with a, uh, with a switch parameter, you have to use colon and then a dollar sign false. And we have the normal parameters that take arguments like uh, get child item dash, uh, dash name and the arguments, you can set specific types for it. Uh, that's something that's also encouraged whenever you're writing your functions to make sure that you set up your types for all the different, uh, for all the different parameters. So you can do the validation, uh, you can do the input validation based on that. And that is something we'll also go into when we go into parameters, how we can make sure that the input is exactly the way uh, it's supposed to be. Any questions so far? Otherwise, I'll uh, demo some function code. So if it's a switch uh, parameter, and you can see that if you do get help or if you do get command, so you can see what kind of input is expected. Also, when you, when you read the, the help documentation, it will specify the, the input type that's expected. If it expects a Boolean, then it's just like any parameter that takes in input, then you don't do a colon. If it's a switch parameter, uh, then you, you have to use the colon, but you only have to use the colon when you want to set it to false. But it's a, in my opinion, it's a poor implementation if there's ever a case where you need to, uh, where you need to set it uh, to false. Ooh, that one. Uh, oh, switch out of that one, so yeah, there we are. Um, I think let's do... I think get item also has this. There we go. Get item has this force, I think. Does it? Yes. Get help, get item. Um, um, let's do dash full. So uh, that's outputs, let's go up. And this is exactly the reason why I mentioned I prefer to look at this. <laughs> so we can see here, if we look at force, we can see that it is a system management automation uh, switch parameter. So the type of each of the, uh, of each of the parameters is specified. Uh, if it, if it is specified, if it's your own function, you can, uh, you can also not specify it. It will take in anything. Uh, so for example, here we have a string. Um, that's also an interesting one to highlight because this is system string with the, uh, what do you call those, the blocky ones. So it means it can either be a single object or it can be an array of uh, strings. Well, technically, it could also be that it has to be an array, but that would be a poor Im implementation once again. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how you can uh, that's how you can see it, uh, whether it's Boolean or switch. Uh, wh whenever I write my uh, my functions, my modules, uh, I use switch parameters. I never use uh, Boolean because I haven't really seen a case where uh, you would have to have uh, Boolean. But it's yeah it. It's not worth fighting over, but if I have the choice, I'll go for switch param parameters. <laughs> yeah. Then you can also look for the specific uh, parameter and then you can uh, look it up more easily and don't uh, waste your time like I just did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, the other way of how you could fix that. So the, the feedback was if, for example, you, you have a command that uh, can enable or disable dedupe, uh, then you could have a switch param uh, uh, parameter that is dedupe, and then you have to set it to false. That's what you're saying, right? Uh, what I would do in that case, I would either make, uh, if it's just a command that only does dedupe, you could make two commands, enable dedupe and disable dedupe, or you could have set dedupe with two uh, parameter sets, and one is enabled and one is disabled, and then both are identical with all the other parameters, but you can only have enabled or disabled. So you then have two switch parameters. So those are two ways of how you could, uh, how you could work with that. Any other questions? No? Cool. Then let's look uh, at some more code. So we'll start off with a simple function, or yeah, simple depends on the on the context, but this one uh, should be relatively easy uh, to understand. So we have the function, uh, we have the function keyword, uh, get personal greeting. We have a parameter name. I'm not following my uh, my best practices so far because I just have it as a uh, as a, a parameter. I didn't specify if it was a string. And it just outputs name, so that should be uh, pretty uh, pretty straightforward. So by running the function, it doesn't execute the code, it just loads it into memory, and to see that it actually did, did. I don't know. <laughs> can you? Can I, can I just get rid of the entire doc? What? Or, or just take out the mouse. I think that's even easier. Done. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a million solutions, but sometimes you should just go for the easiest one. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> We're there. <laughs> uh, yeah, then if, you, uh, if we want to see our function definition, I mentioned that uh, we can do uh, get child item. Let's take a look into function. So we can see. So make it bigger again. We can see that our function should now be defined in here. What was it called again? Get personal greeting. Yep, yep. And then we can also do personal because it supports wildcards. And we could also. I think it's called definition, but that's always the fun thing of live coding. It's not. No, it is called definition. We can do expand property, and we can see our function definition. And this also gets set, yeah? Um, so I noticed like there wasn't any kind of virtual instruction code. Does that need to be set in the functor, or is that modulus? Uh, so yeah, the question is, uh, there's no version information, uh, and there's also no source information, because this is just uh, defined in memory during, uh, during execution. So yeah, there's no, uh, there's no version information. To be honest, it might be possible to define uh, a version, but I, uh, the, the way I would define a version information is by putting it in, uh, in a module and versioning it on, uh, on that level. There might be another way to do it when it's in memory, but I've never, uh, never done so. Although there is a way to load modules directly into memory without them ever touching disk, so that, that would be one way, but yeah, that's, it gets it from the module, uh, either from the module manifest or from the, uh, from the, from the PSM one, uh, yeah. Sweet. Then, so if I run this, obviously it's going to say, uh, yap. So if I would run this, what would happen? It would be very upset because yap does not exist as a command, that is. I still like to think I exist, but. <laughs> <laughs> so what will uh, this one do? Will this one work? No, well, otherwise I wouldn't have had a fourth, fourth example, so <laughs> power of deduction. <laughs> so 
this is what I did before I understood what advanced functions were. Whenever you have something that's not, not an advanced function or a function that doesn't have pipeline support uh, built in uh, natively, you can just uh, parse to either an array or uh, in this case a single entry and just for each it in there. And what we, uh, what we can also see here is we're not specifying name and it's still able to, uh, it's still able to put that information into the right uh, parameter. In this case, it's easy because uh, we only have a name uh, uh, parameter, so obviously it's going to go in there. Uh, if it's not there, then you can use your parameter, uh, you can use parameter options to, uh, de uh, to determine which one is the, is the one that takes pipeline input. And you can determine that on, uh, on many different uh, many different ways because you can take different kind of uh, parameter inputs with a single command, uh, with a single function. Uh, one of the ways that it does this uh, is also based on type. So if you would pipe in a, a, a process object into stop process, then it knows what to do, uh, it knows what to do with that one. And because uh, if your input object has a property that matches uh, matches a parameter that takes pipeline input, it will automatically work and you don't have to do any additional uh, additional steps. So that is how you can uh, enable yourself to uh, get pipeline support in there. We'll, we'll do some examples of that of, uh, as well, of course. So some other things for command discovery. So if we, uh, if we run PBD, we can see that we get our current path. We want to know uh, which command is actually behind there. It's uh, get location. So let's take a look at get location, get exactly the same output. What if we want to have some information about the driver on? We can see, all right, I've used a fair bit of my uh, disk space already can also use get member to dive a bit deeper so we can see everything that's available. So the different properties, script properties, methods. Anyone want to go for the bonus question? What, uh, what the difference is between a method and a property? Yeah, but the assigned values can, can uh, sometimes be get and set. And that is indeed a good point that, uh, that you made is that so sometimes there is some overlap, but in general, the methods are going to be you're going to make a change to the object or make some kind of modification and some, some code will run in order to, uh, to facilitate, uh, facilitate uh, that. And it could be a function, in that case it's, uh, it might be a script, uh, a script uh, property or uh, a method that you define there. Uh, a good example of that is, for example, if we do get item, let's get any kind of item, let's do, so if we have welcome, or welcome PSM1. You can see we have a method available here that is to be delete or remove. We have that. Yeah, we see. Yeah, open would work. So we can also d directly delete uh, the object without using a remove uh, uh, without using the remove item uh, quantlet. So. So in that case, uh, we've taken a look at the different properties that are there. We've established that this is uh, how we can get the free, inf uh, the free space on our disk. So let's start writing a function around that, get some disk space and see, uh, see how that functions and see how we can iterate and improve uh, based, uh, based on that. So we'll start off uh, simple again. We don't have any parameters, we just go, uh, we just go for wrapping this into a function. And this is the baseline of how easy a function can be. We can just output, uh, we can output it directly. Thank you. <laughs> what don't you like about it? <laughs> We'll go take a look at what uh, what we can do to make that better. Some of the comparison uh, comparison operators we're going to run into that uh, later on. And whenever you do anything in PowerShell, it's important to uh, 
uh, to have an understanding of those. So uh, we have here, if we do DevOps equals summit, we get false. Not equals, we get two. What do we get with this one? We get two. What we do we get with the next one? We get two. What do we get with this one? Um, how about this one? <laughs> we get uh, we get false again. So this is uh, one of the um, yeah one of the interesting behaviors of uh, what uh, what what PowerShell does is what whatever we put on the left uh, whatever we put on the left side of the comparison. Uh, uh, when we're using comparison operators, that is uh, that is going to be the uh, what's it called? Uh, th that's going to be the uh, the property type that it tries to infer on the second type. So whenever you're doing comparisons, make sure that things are on the right side because if you turn things around, it uh, it wouldn't necessarily give the same uh, the same result. So. Uh, Documentation. Let's see. Is this the right version? Left. Yep. Yeah, so that, that is another, um, uh, I, I'm, I won't look it up uh, live because I uh, might not be able to, uh, to find it directly. But uh, we, we can see, for example, that uh, here, because uh, we, are, we are specifying an integer, and the second one is a string. But if we would convert this string to an integer, it would be the same value. That's why, it, uh, that's why PowerShell will come back with, yeah, uh, one, the integer is going to be the same as uh, one dot uh, one dot zero, the string. So it will cast it to whatever the the type on the on the left side is. Uh, keep that in mind whenever you're uh, whenever you're doing comparisons. Put whatever uh, whatever is important for what you're comparing on the left side, and it can sometimes be counterintuitive, specifically when you're comparing so things to null. Put null on the left side so you know it's actually null, uh, what, uh, whatever you're comparing with. The other thing that is interesting, because now we ended up on an about page, so there's also uh, about pages, which is basically an entire PowerShell book worth of information about all the different, uh, uh, all the different functionality within PowerShell and how it interacts. Um, I think most of it is, uh, um, uh, has been around for a long time and it's a pretty good source of information whenever you're struggling with a particular topic. Um, I should have definitely made more use of this uh, in the past because I did dirty things in order to work around whenever I didn't understand something. <laughs> so with that in mind, Let's, uh, let's look at a function if we don't have any parameters, uh, if we don't have any parameters defined. Let's see how we can still get some output there. So we'll load up this function. So what we're going to do is still, uh, still similar. We're still going to uh, output get location. The difference uh, I made there is I've now uh, I've now used the pipeline symbols as line breaks, and I indented it just to make people upset because then some people are very particular about the indentation, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we can now see we're 
outputting a bit more information because we have a select object property. It, we, still can't, uh, we still can't read it yet. Let's see, if we use the slash, uh, it will still get the same drive. Uh, but if I make something up, it will just, uh, it will just error out. Uh, what, we have, uh, what we have here, this is uh, different behavior from uh, Windows PowerShell. In Windows PowerShell, whenever an error appears, we will get this big error message. Uh, the default behavior in PowerShell 7 is that it will only show a single uh, message. You can change this. Uh, there's a variable for that or a commandlet. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and you can, uh, you can set it to just output the entire uh, the entire error message. If you want to see the entire error, uh, we have the error variable. And we'll do some indexing into it so we get the last one. Uh, and then, of course, we still need to display everything. And we can see uh, more information and where, uh, where it failed. If uh, this, what's that? We also have get error. Error. Let's see, concise view, and there we go. So uh, double tap, by the way, for anything uh, w when you're working in the console, you can get the entire list. So in this case, this is either an enumeration. I think this is an enumeration. What? Yep. Uh, and you can see anything that's in there. So let's do detailed view. And let's do it again. There we go. So now we get the longer error, error message. Uh, yeah. There we go. So this is the, the default as it was in, uh, in PowerShell, uh, up to PowerShell version uh, 5. So let's uh, do a bit more. Let's do some test path. And let's do some flow control. So we use some if else statement there. So we can go to that. So input is not as we expected. And let's put this into our uh, drive space function now and see if we can catch the error. So the default will still work. And if I run this one, it will no longer give an error message because it no longer goes into, uh, into that path. Is this good error handling? It's not good error handling. <laughs> you can suppress the errors though. Mm, let's see. So let's take a look at variable and pref. So we have a couple of uh, we have a couple of preferences here. So including error action uh, preference. So we can also set it to silently continue here. That's, that's one way to make sure that all your scripts run without any bugs and without any errors. <laughs> and another good solution is to change the color of uh, error messages to green. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, it, it's all about keeping up appearances. That's how I like to do that. So, Another thing, if we uh, take a look at uh, get available drive space, if we do get help, we see that even though we haven't defined any help information, it will already auto generate. Uh, it will already auto generate uh, some help, but because we don't have any parameters, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't help us uh, a whole lot. You can see that the command is available if we do get function, we can see all the functions that we've uh, defined in memory here. And 
I'll skip the star because that one's not that interesting. Can also, uh, we can also see uh, whether we have an advanced, uh, whether this is an advanced function or a basic function. So this one is a basic function and we can see that by commandlet binding, as commandlet binding is our keyword with which we are, uh, with which we are creating uh, advanced functions. So if we're going to uh, step it up and make it a, uh, actually put some parameters in there, we would uh, run get help on this one now. We should be able to see that we have a parameter. So we can see we already have a syntax and because we didn't specify the type of object that we put in there, it will just say object there. And if we do full, we can see more information uh, about the parameter. So for example, uh, required and position. Uh, these, are all, uh, these are all options you can set for your different parameters. Um, currently it's, op uh, it's set in position zero just because it's the only one and well, we, start counting, uh, we start counting at zero. Uh, but there are cases where you might uh, have uh, an, entire, uh, an entire list of parameters, but for some reason you would want the last parameter to be uh, uh, the, the first one in line, then you can also set the pos position directly rather than uh, putting it uh, in order. Cool. Um, that's that. Let's see. Yeah, that's the basic uh, functions. Any questions before we move on from this one? Let's see how we're doing on time. What time we need to have coffee? Ah, good. We still have uh, 15 minutes. I was, uh, I was told whatever I do, I should not go over 10.30. So I've been uh, ma making very sure that I'm not going to uh, cut into your coffee break because uh, other otherwise you're the ones getting the cold coffee and all the other rooms are going to get the hot coffee. So that's not, uh, that's not going to be my intention. I, I'd say it's more something that you would do for clarity when you're working with parameter sets because it, uh, it, might, uh, it can become confusing when you have uh, parameter sets where some things are exclusive and other things are not exclusive and then it can become hard to have the overview of which parameter is in which position. So then I would explicitly define it, not because I have to explicitly define it, but just to make clear where it is. Yeah. Oh, but before, uh, before we continue, the question was, is there any reason uh, why you would explicitly define uh, a position for a parameter? Yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, I showed an example earlier where I did get item and I showed that with get item, we could also remove an item uh, directly instead of, uh, for example, piping it to, uh, to remove item. Are there cases why you would do that? Um, I, I would say for readability, whenever I'm writing scripts and things I share with others, uh, I tend to use the pipeline uh, to just pipe things to. So it's clear, okay, we're getting something, we're using where object, we're filtering to it, and then we take an action on it. So from a readability point of view, I would write it that way. Are there, are there reasons why I would use um, a remove method instead of, uh, uh, instead of doing that. Uh, performance could be, uh, could be a reason. Another reason could be that uh, because in essence PowerShell commandlets or even PowerShell functions are, are wrappers around .NET uh, functionality and because they are wrappers they might not have all the, uh, all the functionality available. So there, there might be some things you can do uh, that are very specific to an object that either perform better or give you more uh, flexibility if you use the underlying uh, method. So performance could be a reason, also functionality could be, uh, could be a reason. Um, uh, let's try to think of an example. Do objective services um, uh, methods be an example? Uh, services, changing the state? Yeah, I think that's a, yeah, that's a, a good example. 
Yeah, that's a good uh, example. But that also depends on the PowerShell version. So example I get uh, from, uh, uh, example I got was services, where you can change the startup methods. Uh, you can't do that with set service on Windows PowerShell. I think you might be able to do it now. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, but what, what, uh, there were basically two ways of doing that. So you could use the sim commandlets or the WMI commandlets to change the startup method, but you could also get the underlying .NET object and then you could directly interact with the startup, uh, startup type. So that can be a reason. Uh, another thing that, uh, that came to mind, I've worked a lot with, uh, with web requests and invoke REST method, invoke, uh, invoke web request. On PowerShell, uh, on Windows PowerShell, uh, it was uh, suboptimal. Um, pa PowerShell six, there were a lot of uh, a lot of improvements, but I had a module that relied on uh, invoke uh, invoke REST method and invoke web request. And so, what I would do in that uh, in that module is I would verify which version of PowerShell I was using and which version of uh, invoke web request, and if I had invoke web request from a Windows PowerShell host or from PowerShell 5 or lower, uh, I would tap into the underlying uh, .NET object so I could still get Unicode out of there because otherwise I would just get ASCII back. And that works really well in well, it works really well in the Netherlands. It works pretty good in the US, I would uh, I would assume. But my Swedish uh, my Swedish customer wasn't too happy that. Uh, they didn't get their proper database names anymore, and they just got question mark, question mark, question mark. It wasn't very helpful to them. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a, that, that's a good point. So uh, the addition to that was uh, if you uh, if you call a .NET method or if you call a method of an object, which most likely is going to be a .NET uh, method, but if it's a yeah a DCOM object or a COM object or something, it might be that. Um, you can't interrupt it. So if you would control C after that, it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't stop. So for example, if you have a, a directory structure and you do remove item, if you find out that you did something dumb, you can control C it and you can not lose as many files. And if you would <laughs> do it on the root with a remove method, you uh, you don't have the what if uh, functionality and you can't interrupt it anymore. <laughs> Good point. No, no. <laughs> so another reason to uh, does it work with that? No, it doesn't work with clipboard. No. <laughs> um, let's see. Yep. Cool. So we've talked a bit about uh, parameters and what we can uh, what we can do with it. Let's uh, go into some uh, specifics. Uh, what I'll do is uh, I think how many slides do I have on parameters? It should be like five or so. Oh, there we go. It's even less than five. So what I'll do is uh, we'll d discuss these. Uh, it's now 10.20, so it should be 10.25 when I finish, and then we can all be the first to the coffee and make sure we get the hot coffee and not the other. So the parameter uh, syntax, so we define our function, so we have function, get, um, get personal greeting, we have the parameter block, uh, and inside there we can, uh, we can set, our, uh, set up our parameters. So Notation uh, can be just string name, then we say it's going to be a string. If you put the square brackets in there, then we can make sure it's an array. We can do more definitions, so we can say parameter, uh, mandatory true, string name is, and we can also set default uh, values. So. Um, th that is something that uh, w whenever I'm trying to convince uh, one of my colleagues to move to functions or to, uh, to stop uh, uh, writing scripts in which somewhere in the middle of their script they're going to define some uh, default variables. Uh, and then whenever you try to reuse that script, it's not reusable because they just define everything inside, uh, in, inside of 
uh, inside of the script. So just having a parameter block at the top and just putting all your definitions there. By the way, the parameter block also just works for script uh, files. It's not exclusive to, uh, to functions. Uh, and also parameter sets can be, uh, can be set up there. So the best practices are uh, use descriptive parameter names. So if you just make it object one, object two, object three, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be very helpful. Um, your parameters, they can also uh, have, um, uh, have comment-based help. So comment-based help, we haven't uh, covered it yet. We'll, uh, we'll show some in the, in the demos. You can just put a comment block, uh, just a comment above your function directly, uh, above your parameter directly, and you can write whatever you want to write about it. Or you can put an entire comment block uh, either in front of your function or uh, what is typical is before the parameter uh, before the parameter block inside of the function. Both uh, both work. Uh, I usually put it inside of the function to make it uh, to make it clear that it is part of uh, part of the function. And let's see parameter uh, validation. Uh, so uh, you can set specific types like the string or like a, like an integer or a switch uh, parameter. <laughs> You can also validate if something uh, uh, is, is what you expect it to be. So what we saw when we were using the error, what was it called, the error? Yeah, error view. So er with error view, uh, we, we had an enum there, so we can just tap to it. If you have a validate set for your uh, parameter, you can also just tap to it, or if you do tap twice, you will see the entire list of um, a list of options available. So you make it more user friendly as well. So for someone that is using your script, so using your functions, you make it more discoverable what is possible. Because even if you don't write any documentation for it, it's somewhat documented because at least people know what can be put in there. And yeah, then the default, uh, the default values in general, I. Uh, in most cases, I would steer away from default uh, from default values. There are cases where uh, where it does make uh, where it does make sense. If you want to uh, if you want to control uh, a specific default uh, parameter values, you can also do it outside of your function or outside of your module, and you can do that with uh, PS default parameter values. And the way that works is that is a hash table. You can add the command name and then the parameter name and you can set the default value there. And we have parameter sets. Has anyone ever used dynamic parameters? Yeah? Was it a fun experience? No. <laughs> <laughs> It, it can be quite useful, yes. I'll, uh, I'll show some examples of where I used it, where it, it was quite useful, but it, uh, understanding what's going on, it goes against what I was saying earlier, where you can make things easier to understand by using advanced uh, parameter functionality. This one makes it harder to understand, but definitely more powerful, and there's some, some really good uh, use cases. So uh, after our coffee break, I'd like to hear what uh, you and some of the others have done uh, with it. And uh, for now, thank you, and uh, I'll see you back at uh, 11. All right, welcome, uh, welcome back, everyone. We actually have a PowerShell, little PowerShell quiz before we continue with all the code, just to. Uh, but the, the challenging part will be not to show the answers before. <laughs> Da, da, da. Oh yeah, easy. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, how are we going to do this? I guess we're just going to do a show of hands. Who thinks it's number two? The B, sorry. <laughs> this is uh, to warm up a little bit. Uh, Cat process, I, I've already showed it, so I assume that most, uh, most here are familiar with that one. It is indeed get process. 
Next one, bit of a trick question. Which one is for case insensitive string comparison? Uh, so A is actually case sensitive. So the C stands for case sensitive. I is specifically case insensitive, but the default with uh, dash equal is also case insensitive by, uh, uh, by default. So in case uh, the defaults are not what you expect, then because you, it, it might be on a system that runs with different kind, to, uh, with different kind of defaults. Um, so if, for example, if you would do it on a Linux file system, then you might want to explicitly make it uh, uh, insensitive. So yeah, C was specific, but uh, B I would have counted. I was thinking of doing like this whole thing with a QR code, but then I would have had everyone to scan the QR code and we would probably waste 10 minutes on that, so. <laughs> Sweet, so in Pester, what command is used to define a block of test cases or can contain a block? <coughs> I heard B in. Anyone else have a different idea than B? No, well, that was the correct answer. Yeah? Is it going to be B again? <laughs> That's the question. What is two? Is anything two? Anyone? Yeah, see, not all B. What does the pipeline operator do? Not all B. There we go. <laughs> there we go. It was just a, just a short uh, break just to get everyone back, uh, back into the room. So since we did have a break, I'll just open up the slides where we were before. So we talked about parameter best practices. So descriptive param parameter names. Do some parameter validation, include parameter sets. You can set default, uh, default values. Dynamic parameters, I'll show them. Uh, I heard that Christian also had some use cases for it. I had some use cases for it, so we're going to take a look at, uh, we're going to take a look at that. Um, my idea is that we'll go slides, uh, demos for approximately the next hour and then we'll go take a look at a couple of implementations of PowerShell, of PowerShell functions and try to understand why things were implemented in a, in a certain way. So tying back to what I said at the start, if you have a function that's publicly available uh, on GitHub, we can, take a, we can take a look at that. Uh, you can get feedback from an entire room of people. So if you're, uh, if you're brave enough and otherwise I'm going to be brave enough, and we're just going to have a look at my, uh, at my functions, but up to you. Does that sound good? I've unplugged the mouse, so we're not going to have the, the taskbar pop up anymore. I've run the demos, and they didn't all fail, so. Cool. So, yeah, we're not going to run this one. Oh, wait, we are going to run this one. There was a reason it was, this was here. So we have get greeting again, a variation of get personal greeting that we uh, ran before. But this time, uh, we followed some better practices. We can now include, uh, we can, uh, we've included that the name is a string, and also that it's, uh, uh, that it's mandatory. One thing to note here is I, uh, I wrote this as mandatory is two, but this is also a switch parameter, so there's no reason to include mandatory is two. So we can also leave it out, and uh, then it's present, and that is good enough. The only reason why you would want to do this, I think it's PowerShell 2, but if I'm wrong, someone will uh, correct me. I think PowerShell 2, you needed to specify it, but it's no longer uh, necessary. 
So for all the all the switch ones, we can uh, we can leave it out. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm not particular. I out of habit, I still write mandatory is two because I've been writing it for uh, for I don't know a decade, <laughs> more than a decade. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, let's uh, let's run this one. Let's uh, get away from that topic. <laughs> so yeah, if we do uh, get greeting, we can see okay, it won't throw an error, but we do have to enter something. So that is good because if we use it interactively, that is indeed uh, indeed what we want. But this also has the downside that if you uh, if you run this uh, in a in a pipeline or in some kind of automated process. You can shoot yourself in the foot as well if you use parameter is uh, is mandatory, because you can break uh, you can break your workflow, and it, it's it's obvious that you should always put something in. But if you have a workflow where you assume that some that some value is going to be populated by the previous commands that were executing, and for some reason that is not the case, you might break your workflow. And imagine if you have this in a startup script with GPOs or uh, with uh, anything like that, then you would never get to anymore. So use it with caution. Uh, sometimes it's better to just throw an error and don't use uh, uh, this kind of uh, validation. So th there, is a, uh, th there is a time and a place where you can uh, not be that specific and throw an error at a different point or yeah, throw an error instead of getting uh, this kind of uh, behavior. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. So I mentioned uh, validation. Uh, there's a couple of things that we can do there. Uh, we have validate set, we have validate script, uh, we have validate pattern. Validate pattern is with regular expressions. Who here loves regular expressions? Wow, <laughs> actually love it? <laughs> <laughs> Just have ChatGPT write it. It will very convincingly come up with things, and it's sometimes right. <laughs> Ultimate consultant for the consultants in there. <laughs> so to showcase, uh, obviously, this doesn't uh, do a whole lot because we don't uh, do anything with it. But uh, oh wait, I should do it in the. In here. So if you do set environment, we can see we have the environment and we can just tap to it and we can see all the options we have. So we make it easier, like I mentioned, and make it easier for our end users to be able to discover uh, what, is, uh, what is in there. So validate set is one way of doing it. Uh, you could go one step further. You could uh, define your own classes because classes are supported. You can also define your own enums and then set an enum instead of uh, ins instead of just a string. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, what Christian said was that uh, you can override this, so you can go for an option that is not uh, that is not in the validate set by setting a default value. <laughs> Let's see if it's the case. <laughs> this this is recorded. You can just you can show this video. You just have to. Co copy at time. This is uh, what you need to do. Just clip it. <laughs> there we go. It's on the internet now. It's forever. <laughs> Sweet. So let's take a look at uh, some. Uh, let's make this one bigger. So we have a. Uh, a slightly longer function. So what we have here, we have the parameter. Uh, we say pipeline is two. Uh, two is again optional. Uh, we say it's a string. Um, 
we have a begin process end block. So for any function, um, uh, for any function that you create, but also for any for each uh, for each object that you run, you always have a begin process and end block. But if you just uh, if if you don't specify it, it will just always assume that you're in the in the process uh, block. So now we specify it uh, to highlight that this is actually the case and to show what you can uh, what you can do with it. So what we do in the begin block, the begin block, we uh, 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 we just say starting function. We initialize our variable. So whenever you do anything with counts or things like that, you can put it in your begin block. The process block will run for any name that's uh, put in there. And the end block, it will uh, say uh, how many times uh, it executed, if it works. So let's load that one up. So then this should work, right? It does not work because it is still not a right command. So that's a bit of a downside. We have to write it like that, like this, and we can see starting function, receive name. How does that yep, I can uh, show, show that here. Uh, so this is shorthand for, for each object, should be known to most of you. So we can see it's the process block because it just shows this 10 times. Uh, what? This does apply to functions. So if you don't specify it in your function, it is a similar behavior to for each object. And if you specify two, then I assume this is the begin block, but now I'm not entirely certain. So let's see if this is the case, because it might be that it's process and end, because I'm not specifying it. So let's find out. Yeah, that was right. But you get, with for each object, you have, the, uh, you have that as parameters. So we have begin and we have uh, process. So this is a similar behavior in for each object as well as in, uh, um, in your functions. And what this, uh, what this allows you to do is, uh, I, I see a lot of people that uh, use for uh, server in servers just so, they can, uh, just so they can have a count. And you can just do it with for each object this way and then you use the pipelining uh, methodology instead of uh, uh, for, the uh, keyword for. Yeah, but you can use pipeline variable for that uh, if you're using for each object. So if you don't want to confuse your do dollar uh, underscore, then you can also do pipeline variable and then specify uh, something. And then if you go down another level, then the the parent uh, the, the, the parent uh, uh, loop will have that variable. But uh, yeah, otherwise you can also manually in the process block also just assign the variable. But if you get to that point, uh, you probably, uh, well, it, yeah, as always, it depends. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, pipeline variable, I think it's only available if I would pipe this onwards to the, to the next one, then something is available. So let's try it. So if I do this, then it should be, Probably going to be begin and one to ten. Let's see. Yeah, and then something should be ten. So it should be ten times ten, I think, or is it everything? Let's find out. Yeah, that's, yeah, something is just. <laughs> so you you get it from one uh, from one level up. So you can you can set the pipeline variable uh, there. The ma main reason to use for instead of use uh, for each object, so the for keyword, is uh, once again performance uh, and depending on what you are uh, trying to achieve. If you want something to run as fast as possible, in most cases the for keyword is faster because there is no pipelining with the for keyword. So what you get with a for statement is whatever is in that statement is going to execute. You can't 
pipe it. You, well, you can pipe it, but you can only pipe it when it's completed. What happens with for each object that it moves to the pipeline. So if things have some kind of delay in there or it takes longer to execute, the first object that's completed in a, in a for each object pipeline will be put onto the next command so it can start processing that one while the rest is still coming in. And that's not the case with four. So that, that is a consideration to, uh, to keep in mind uh, if you're trying to optimize for, uh, for performance. So the question is, is there a difference between uh, for each object and the for each keyword? Uh, yes, but it also depends on the version of PowerShell that you're, uh, that you're using. So it used to be, I'm not sure if it was five or six, where if you used the for each, uh, the for each method of an array, that it would be faster than using for each object, but I think they optimized that now. Uh, another example, uh, it's a bit of a tangent, but another example of something that was performing poorly was if you would pipe things to out null, uh, it would start an entire new pipeline every time you would pipe to out null. Well, the only thing that you wanted to do was make sure that it doesn't show up on screen. And uh, and the faster way was to do a dollar null or uh, uh, give it a void type, use the void type accelerator, that would be, uh, would be faster. Uh, but those are things that they've optimized as PowerShell, as PowerShell matured. So I think in current version, there should not be a performance uh, difference there. Uh, so the question is, uh, what, what if you use for each parallel? Is that going to perform worse or better? That really depends on the kind of workload that you're, uh, that you're doing. So if, if you're doing something like a ping command, which will always take, well, three seconds and a number of milliseconds with the default amount of pings, uh, then for each parallel will almost, uh, always be faster because you do, you, you do multiple at the same time. Uh, is for each parallel always the fastest way? No, there's also run space jobs and you can make your own run space, uh, your own run space factories using the .NET, uh, uh, .NET uh, uh, classes yourself. That might be faster, but it, it depends what you're, uh, what you're trying to do. I'd say for each parallel or a start PS job, uh, which is the same technology, uh, if you have longer running jobs, it will perform better if you do, uh, if you do that, yes. But if you're doing something like uh, a calculation or something that is uh, adding something to, uh, to an array or things like that, then it will not be, uh, not be faster. And you might get unexpected results because one command might uh, finish faster than another and then things get out of order. So that's one thing you need to keep in mind uh, there as well. If the order of uh, processing is important, then using uh, parallelization is, uh, yeah, can, can give you additional uh, complications as well. But for, for tasks where you try to do things against uh, multiple servers or uh, yeah, yeah, multiple, any, uh, anything remote from your system, uh, you can increase the performance by quite a bit, yeah. The question is, would for each object be faster uh, if you use, uh, if you don't pipe into it, but you use input object? Yes, that is uh, similar to uh, what, what I mentioned with piping to out, uh, to out null. It used to be faster if you use uh, input object, but as far as I know, that's been optimized. It might still be slightly slower, but uh, the way the compiler, uh, the way the compiler works is, it looks at uh, what is happening in the code and it will do just-in-time compilation to fix whatever inefficiency is in your code and optimize it on the, on the back end. So it should not be slower anymore. I would be surprised if it's still the case because uh, they have worked on that. But if anyone from the PowerShell team would be in the room, uh, we, can, uh, we can definitely ask them later. I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll show up. Uh, I, I'm going to change this one now and we'll do it without a process block and we're going to see if it works. I think that's, is that fair? I, I would assume that uh, it would work because it's, I think it should be in flight. Yes, I can repeat the question. The question was, uh, 
is the process block uh, implied in a function? And yeah. So uh, what we got from Christian is that uh, everything, uh, it, sorry. <laughs> so for basic functions, it's, uh, it is the case. For uh, advanced functions, it's not the case. Uh, in this one, I don't use commandlet binding, but this one will still default to uh, being an advanced function because we use some of the advanced uh, functionality here. So, yeah. So we can verify that by looking at function. Uh, get item function. Uh, see, no process, and then select star, and it should still be comma binding two. See, so even if uh, in this case, uh, so, so just to take one step back. Uh, even though we didn't explicitly use commandlet binding here, we implicitly used it by uh, using the uh, value from pipeline, which is only available in advanced function, so it knows it is an advanced uh, function. So let's verify that this, so you're saying that it would not work on an advanced function, like this, or? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Th that's my understanding as well. So yeah, it it would say that's the case. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And I've never understood why that is. That's always been a question because that makes no logical sense. Yeah. But somebody who wrote this thing that's way smarter must have a reason. <laughs> <laughs> so it, tur it turned out that uh, the default is that it goes into the end block. That's why in the example here, uh, we also saw that it only shows the, the, last, uh, the last object. So that's uh, good to know. Uh, yeah, so let's go back to this function and load up this one again. So if we do receive a name, we can see we get one names. Uh, if we do multiple ones, uh, and this is one that, uh, that I always find a bit of a pain, that whenever you need to put an array in, you need to put quotation marks around all the, all the different names. Uh, luckily, there is an easier way to do it as well. So we just do, yeah, Fred, Christian, and just pipe it like this. So echo is uh, alias for uh, write output. So now we don't need to put uh, quotation marks around it. So it's nice, uh, nice shorthand. I like it. Anything that makes it shorter is good for me. So let's run that. You can now say we have three names. But one of the things that still annoys me is that if it's only one name, it says processes names. So let's, uh, let's go fix that. I mean, an if else statement would, uh, of course, be pretty simple to implement. But 
uh, we haven't used switch, uh, switch blocks yet. So in this case, we'll use, uh, we'll use a switch block. We'll switch it on count. Uh, if count is one, then it will be name, and otherwise it will be names. It will still be wrong for zero, but. Sweet. So now the dynamic parameters. What we need to do to just get a dynamic uh, parameter in there. Uh, let's see if I can. Let's see. There we go. Some line wrapping. So we need to uh, we need to create a parameter dictionary, we need a runtime parameter, we need to create objects for that, we need to add our parameters in there, and then we need to return the parameter dictionary. So it makes it uh, uh, slightly, uh, slightly harder to read what, is going to, uh, what the result is going to be. And in this case, there's also not a real reason to do this because we just specify a single parameter. But to show what we get here, uh, the one of the things that I should have mentioned is we can have both. So we can have a normal uh, parameter block and we can also have a dynamic block next to it. So it can be in addition to the uh, parameters as well. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, if, uh, if you are going to use dynamic parameters, uh, keep performance in mind because every time uh, you access your function, whenever you type a parameter, it will calculate the dynamic parameters. So even if it's just a quarter of a second delay, it's going to be annoying. So keep that, uh, keep that in mind. <coughs> so we need to specifically say commandlet binding. I'm actually, yeah, okay, let's let's give it a go. We'll first uh, run it as is. See that it uh, yeah, does as little as it does, but just to showcase how that works, get dynamic data. And we have the dynamic param. So we can see we have the dynamic parameter value that we put in there. And let's see if we can break it by moving Commandlet binding. I think it would break it now because it's not implied anymore, but let's see what happens. And <coughs> yeah, so it doesn't work now, but would it still not work if we Make it implied. That's what I wonder. So yeah, what we're doing now is trying to find out how smart PowerShell is and where where, where we are breaking it. <coughs> ah, it works again. So uh, yeah, it does work with uh, with implicit. Uh, commandlet binding, but it doesn't work if it doesn't know commandlet binding. So yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's some edge cases there. So uh, what I, I had a chat with, uh, with Christian before he also used dynamic parameters. What did you, uh, what did you use it for? Hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I can show it uh, at the end uh, if you can uh, if you can send it on Twitter. That, uh. Cool. Well, uh, we'll take a look at it uh, near the near the end of the, the session. Let's see. Oh, yeah, we still have time. Good, good. Uh, in my case, uh, the use case that I had uh, for it was um, uh, in uh, on the Windows file system. You have all kinds of uh, all kinds of attributes on your uh, on your well every file system. There's a lot of attributes. So if we take a look at uh, let's say parameter should be what do we have here? Yeah, parameter. So we do get item parameter 
So if we see this and we take a look at kind of things uh, we have available, you can see that there's a, a lot of um, a, a lot of properties that are available. That's also what you see in Windows Explorer. So uh, what is the extension? What kind of uh, uh, um, when was it changed? Uh, what, what's the path? There's, there's a lot of default, uh, a default attributes for every file. But in Windows, there's also uh, extension attributes and they are uh, not only Windows version specific, but also specific uh, based on whatever is configured on that uh, particular uh, Windows box. And in order to work with those extension attributes and to make them more discoverable, uh, I have a function here and I needed uh, for myself, I needed to have a reason to use dynamic parameters. So this was, uh, this was the reason for me. Uh, yeah, for uh, do you guys use GitHub? Yeah. Use it once, heard of it, probably, yeah? Do you know what dot does if you press dot on GitHub? Yes. yes. Ah, excellent. So I hear that it also works in Azure DevOps now, so makes it uh, makes it a lot easier to uh, to show off code directly uh, directly from GitHub. So what I did here, so you can see the same uh, the same kind of logic. So we have attributes, uh, we have the parameter set names, and now instead of uh, specifying a single uh, a single uh, uh, attribute, we are uh, a single parameter. We're now specifying the attributes uh, of that parameter, which we could uh, fill in. So we can see an overview and we can tap to it or get a list of all the available extension attributes. And the kind of things you can think of, uh, if it's a photo, for example, it will tell you the location or the kind of camera. But the exact naming of that is also dependent on the localization of your Windows version. So it's, I'm happy I never had to do anything with it professionally. For me, it was just a reason to, uh, to use dynamic, uh, dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic parameters. So. Something you can do, and I, yes. Uh, if I don't, I don't have to set this, no. So the, the, the comment was, uh, I specifically set, uh, set this to all parameter sets. Is that mandatory? No, because I don't think I have different parameter sets because all I have is full name. So what this does is it just looks at the file name or the folder name and then it will collect it uh, based, on, uh, based on that. So no, it's not, uh, not mandatory. It's a bit of boilerplate code as well. Uh, let's see from when this one is. Yeah, 2015. So it's like, let's get away from the topic of me being old. <laughs> no. So the question is, uh, would we be able to use full name uh, in here? Uh, no, we would not be able to use that because this is before the function executes, so then it doesn't have access uh, to that. Uh, yeah, the only way you could do that is if you would specify it before the function, uh, before the function execute, but yeah, then you get. Uh, so the question is, if you want to take the input that comes into the function as input for dynamic parameters? Yeah, I would, as, as far as I'm aware, you need to do, you need to put them as uh, as existing variables before the function executes and not as a parameter of the function. There might be a way of doing it, but I, I'll, uh, I'll summarize it for the rest of the audience and the recording. Uh, yes, it is possible uh, in some cases because it has to be specified before the dynamic parameter. If you use splatting, you need to use an ordered uh, an ordered list and not a default hash table because then you're not in control of the order and then, uh, yeah, semi-random. So that's dynamic parameters. I, I can still confuse myself with that. So if you, if you want to keep yourself in, uh, in a job or at an assignment, then these are the kind of technologies you should be using. <laughs> Because you'll be the only one that understands it. Cool. 
So let's get into uh, some parameter uh, parameter sets and see what we can do with those. So what we have here is a command that binding. I've been a good scripter this time. I've actually supplied it. And I've also set a default uh, parameter uh, set. So that's uh, by name is the default. And uh, we specify name as a string. And we specify the ID as an integer. So this is what I mentioned earlier uh, as well, is that uh, by specifying uh, things by uh, specific types, as well as by, uh, 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 by name, then you can, uh, you can have your functions uh, be better at pipelining things into it, even if uh, you, you're piping something in there that was not exactly expected for that function, as long as it has a name or uh, ID property, it will be able to uh, understand what is happening. Uh, and still execute correctly. And we'll do some experimentation with that to see how that, uh, how that works and how we can uh, show that. So let's see. Get resource. Uh, we could just do name test. So we can see that we get it by, by name. So if we do get resource without specifying it, let's see if it understands. It does not understand that. Let's pipe it into in there. That should also not uh, work. Uh, let's try that. So you don't have pipelining available? No. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't expect it to fail there. And if we would specify it by ID, you can see that we get it uh, by ID. If we would um, uh, if we would enable pipelining, then we can also uh, we can also pipe things in there. And if we have a PS custom objects or any kind of objects that either contains a name or an ID and a name and an ID then it will default to the name because uh, we, specified, uh, we, we specified that uh, the default one is that it goes by, uh, by name. Cool. So let's do a bit with a validate script and see what we uh, can do with that. Um, so valid, the way validate uh, script works is uh, you, can, uh, you can provide a script block as long as that script block returns true or false or just something and then it will assume it's true because uh, everything is true because true is on the left side. Uh, then um, uh, it, will, uh, it will accept it. And one of the benefits of using, uh, of using validate script over, for example, validate pattern Validate pattern is nice because you get regular expressions and they're really powerful. But the moment that regular expression fails, then uh, it's really hard to understand for people what they did wrong. So that is for me a major reason not to use uh, regular expressions. Even if I want to use regular expressions, I would probably still use a validate script because then at least you can include an error message or write error or write warning. This is what we're expecting here. So that is why I, in general, would go for validate script, even though validate pattern would perform better in that case. So let's see if it actually works. Before I go off on too long of a tangent, so I'm trying to show this. Um, let's do parameter PS1. You can see it's a valid file path. And let's do slash users. No, that is not correct. So in this case, uh, we, we don't have any kind of error handling uh, included in here. So it will, uh, it will explain why it's not returning uh, to. But what we could do is we could, uh, we could put a, a if else statement or a switch statement in here. So we can do a write warning or a write error. So we can control the kind of error message that is, uh, that is coming uh, out there. And that is something that I would advise, yes. Uh, so, 
the way I implemented it was just a right warning as an informational thing. So I just let it, I, I let it fail the, say, the, the same way, but I use the warning, uh, warning message to give people an idea of why it failed. So I still let it fail the same way. But there are cases where you can make it break in a, in a specific way by throwing an error. I generally use write error instead of throw because throw uh, overrides your default error, error variable. So you can make things uh, yeah, more difficult for yourself that way. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. So the question is what, what do I prefer to use when, whenever I'm uh, using validate script? If I use throw or if I use uh, write error, and then I would use write error because then the error action preference that you specify, uh, you can control. You can still capture the errors in the error variable that that you specify if you enable that for your function or the general uh, the, the general error uh, variable. So I would uh, I would use that. Uh, it's, oh yeah, let's let's highlight that as well because that was a, was a good example of uh, why we uh, why we do that. So if we would do error action preference typing is hard. Uh, uh, another so it's silently continue. And if we check it now, you can see that it's set to silently continue. One of the, one of the nice things that uh, some of you will be aware of, but others uh, will not, that any enum in PowerShell, enums are always uh, ordered. Uh, you can also just use uh, array indexing once again. So you can just say is zero. And then it's still silently continue. And if it's one, then I think that was stop, but yeah. So you can set it directly this way. Once again, this is really good to use if you want to make your code harder to maintain and harder to understand. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the question is if I change the 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 parameter name. No, because the validation script looks at the validation of the parameter it's set on. So it doesn't matter uh, uh, what will happen if, uh, if it does validate and it is a file. If I would make this one uh, not file path, then it will just display nothing because not file path is not specified. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I, I think I understand the question. So if I, if I change a file path within the function, if it would then still break the validation. As far as I'm aware, that validation happens the moment it, uh, it checks that parameter. If you change it later on, it would not matter. So yeah, the way I understand what Christian is saying is that if, it, if it's like a bar and there's a bouncer at the door, if you get in and you're not drunk, they will let you in. But if you get shit-faced at the bar, it doesn't matter because you're already in. Did you get it? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, so let's put the error action and let's see what we get then. We so test file path, valid, and then if we make it a user, it will no longer throw an error now because we made it nice and silent. So. Uh, if we would use throw in there, then it would still be messy as far as I think. So let's actually find out if that's the case. I'm not sure, if, I don't think I need the double, but I just do it to not break it on that. So this is another one. You can use the exclamation mark instead of uh, dash not. Another one to make your code more complicated to understand for others. Uh, if not, then throw error. 
So let's intentionally go and see what we get then. So test file path. Oh no, it still uh, still behaves properly. But yeah, there there are cases where towing uh, might complicate things. But in this case, apparently it it doesn't override it. I'm uh, I'm surprised because I thought in most cases it would. But uh, th that is all. Yeah. Return error. Yeah, then now it doesn't like it anymore. <laughs> we broke it. Oh wait, no, did we? Yeah, yeah, we did. Hmm. So yeah, I like write error because then it does what I expect it to do. There's <laughs> a lot of ways you can break your code. <laughs> It's, it's always a lot more fun to break it when it's not in production and when it's not a Friday. <laughs> well, never, not never. If it's the Friday before you, uh, so the, the, it wasn't a question, it was a statement. Never change anything on Friday. If you don't like the people you are on the team with <laughs> and you're about to go on a holiday, change something on Friday. <laughs> yep. So it does error out? No. Oh. Let let's so like mm -hmm. um, do it. Let's let's do it. So if you just on one point eight or one point two, just say file path equals something that doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get rid of test to discover a new data. Get a return. There we go. Now we're good again, right? Yeah. So you're saying that if I do change it inside, it would fail. So let's first and this one. So error actual preference. Okay, so it fails, but if we do parameter, it passes. And it's so fail. Quotation marks. Okay, that's interesting. My, my assumption was that it would not reevaluate. So let's see what happens. So we run it against a file, and it's still, yeah, OK, yeah, cool. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. OK, well, I guess don't get drunk in a bar. That's a conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> that's my takeaway. <laughs> Cool. So another one with a, a default uh, uh, with a default uh, parameter so that we can uh, access the objects of it. So it's uh, not the way that I would format my date, but just to show uh, that uh, you have access to the to the full object and you can make it a more normal uh, looking date because the American date notation always confuses me. 
I'm, I'm just a simple European soul. It's, uh... Yep. And then if we do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a yeah. Ah, there we go. Now it's bananas. Yeah. So for for the uh, for the people in the audience. Uh, if you are going to work with the variables that you define as a specific type, uh, if it can be converted to that type, so in this case we had a date-time object, we could not, uh, bananas is not a proper date-time object, so that one failed. So you explicitly have to set the type if you reuse that, uh, that same variable. Uh, the best approach would be not to reuse that variable. <laughs> But if you do, then set the explicit, uh, explicit type. And then PowerShell starts to look like an actual programming language where if you don't specify the correct type, you're going to get errors. So. That one will go for a validate, uh, validate range. So that's also one of the validation that you can do. So you can set a certain range. So in this case, this is one, uh, one to 100. So if you do some, anything out of that range, you get a similar error again. Nothing, uh, nothing too exciting there. But you need to break things, so. Let's see, 100, so that works. 101 does not work. 91.5 does work because it can be converted to the integer. So that does work. So this one is a nice, uh, a nice function that uh, I'm not going to run because that's, that's uh, ha ha having to have faith in my code and I don't have that much. Uh, I don't have that much uh, faith in my code, but uh, th this is another situation uh, where uh, confirm impact can be uh, uh, can be beneficial because it will prompt you. Uh, oh, uh, let's just uh, no, I'm not going to. Yeah, yeah, I can just comment this one out. So what confirm impact does is that it will ask you, are you sure you want to? Uh, are you sure you want to do this potential destructive thing? You can also do this for your own functions. It's similar to parameter mandatory. If you do this in any kind of automated workflow and it, uh, and it prompts you, then you might break your automated workflow again. So you might not, want to, uh, might not want to do that. But there are, of course, good cases where you w do want to do it because, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, it can, uh, it, can also, um, uh, it can also help protect you from accidentally deleting a whole bunch of data. So, for example, you think it's going to delete a single file, so you then press yes because it's supposed to be an interactive script. Then when the second one pops up, you know that probably that was not supposed to happen, so you can still get out of it instead of uh, 
getting rid of all your files. This is also a case, just tying back in to using that .NET object to delete it. That would be uh, bad because then you actually delete uh, everything. I, I've had it with a with a, a colleague of mine, who was totally not me, who di didn't do proper input uh, validation on a function like this to clean up uh, temporary files. It's really fast, it can delete a lot. <laughs> People that say that PowerShell isn't fast, it's like, pff, all the server's gone. Uh, n another one to keep in mind, whenever you have uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, long running scripts that are resetting servers, make sure you have some time of time validation because if it passes or gets stuck for some reason and then in the middle of the day for some reason starts running again, people will get upset. <laughs> Those uh, were the, the old Windows days where we actually manually reset all the all the workstations during uh, during nighttime, just to make sure that it was like fresh and good to go again. It's great when it happens at nighttime. It's less good when it happens during daytime. And let's see. So aliases. Because we like customizing things, we can also throw aliases for our commandlets uh, functions. We don't talk about commandlets. So server status, this computer name, uh, that works. Oh, we should actually do server one. Uh, but if we tap, or if we type uh, host name, it will also autocomplete. And if we do get member, do we get to see the aliases? I oh, know because it's just the output. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if we do the the if we look at the definition of this function, we would be able to see the different uh, the different aliases that are uh, that are assigned there. Let's see, we're at twelve oh ten. So. Um, I'll break out of this one because I can keep on going on about all the different options about parameters. But I think it would be more fun to do the last 20 minutes with some actual examples of uh, scripts and uh, advanced uh, functions. So we'll start out with uh, the one Christian. Did you send it on Twitter? Yep, cool. Let's hope I don't have an offensive Twitter t timeline at the moment. Apologies if I do. There we go. Okay, let's take a look. So we have <laughs> that's what I'm uh Is this something Azure? No, just a basic concept of um, more like how to implement here several rules, for example, that have in common one thing like the root. And for example, we have the root of the, for an API, in the generic API, user and device. And you can say, OK, if I do, and I just want to have an endpoint wrapper function, then, OK? And then you go straight to and create this um, parameter set specifically on the rules that you choose. And the output it says down below, you can see it there in the refresh screen if I go. Um, you would directly point to the uh, default parameter, so they also use parameter set name, which um, endpoint choose and that the parameter would be from the regular parameter. Mm -hmm. So and in this case, it's just uh, Yeah. Cool. So it's more or less like how to generate the function. So 
Sorry? Have you raised the Kyoto Extended Clause? Mm -hmm. Like I kept them in the GitHub as in my contract that um the functional search will search. Ah, that's, that's a pretty sweet uh, sweet use case. More useful than the extension attributes uh, that I showed. <laughs> cool. Uh, does anyone have a function that uh, they want to have taken, uh, taken a look at? Excellent. Then I'll just uh, go, uh, go for something. So some of the things that... Uh, uh, some of the things that uh, we didn't uh, didn't cover yet is some of the some of the more advanced use cases where um, w when you're working with structured uh, with uh, structured data uh, where the, the kind of code that you're writing is uh, very predictable uh, sometimes it can also be worth to uh, to have either PowerShell code that will write your code for you or to do an abstraction layer on top of it because you, every command is going to be the same uh, anyway. So let's take a look at an example uh, for that and see, uh, see what that can look like. So what we'll do is uh, we'll take a look at some of the, some of the command that uh, we have uh, available here. So I uh, didn't like configuring my Windows 11 every time. And uh, what I did was I just make uh, I just made a function for every every setting that I always uh, wanted to execute. But instead of putting all the information of the registry information or uh, wh whatever kind of information we needed to set in order to set this particular se uh, setting, uh, I abstracted it away. I created a function that's called invoke configuration data and the entire function and how it executes is, uh, is done based on that. And it can have uh, different sources. So let's take a look at uh, what that can look like. So if you look at invoke uh, configuration uh, data, it will take a look at uh, which command that uh, was called. You gotta write verbose in there. Uh, Look for uh, the specific uh, configuration data, and then based on uh, what it was, whether it was set or uh, let's see what's the else. Uh, oh yeah, get or uh, remove. Uh, for remove, uh, I didn't have any of command that uh, did remove yet, so that one's still empty. It would then execute and make changes to that. Uh, registry value, and if it was an external command, we could also put additional information in there for that. So, for example, uh, if I want to hide the file extensions, then, uh, where did I put data? Data, so file extension. Uh, we can see here that I have a JSON file uh, that I can then uh, maintain, so if there would be any changes, I don't have to update my commandlet, but I could do it here. Is this the most practical way of doing it? No, but I was bored and I figured I could abstract things away until I got to a point where, uh, where I was happy, so. That is uh, one of those, and um, what else can we do with this one? See if there's any in here that didn't have a registry value. Are they all registry? Ah, that's unfortunate. And I'll go for this one. This was my uh, one of the functions when I was still in an uh, uh, in an open uh, open floor plan office. Uh, the 
sometimes have things on my screen that should not be on my screen, and I needed to have a way to quickly uh, quickly hide all my windows. So <laughs> don't don't ask me why. So I tapped into user DOL, the, got the show window uh, method, and what I was able to do is I could set up uh, I could set up this uh, this function uh, with a list of uh, either window names or programs that were running, and then the moment I would press enter, they would all be gone in my PowerShell window. And if I would either press enter again or type my password, then all my windows would, uh, would come back. So it was, was pretty useful. I haven't used it for a while, but... Uh, yeah, so those were the two examples I had there. Um, that one... Go to uh, let's see. Well, we still have 15 minutes. Let's go a bit into uh, error handling then. Or uh, are there any questions I can answer? Because, like I said, I've, I'm talking for three hours, and I, I gotta make it as relevant as possible instead of just broadcasting. But if you want to hear error handling? I can also go into that. Error handling. Sweet. Let's do it. It's, it's good to hear that you all like to hear me talk more than I do, so that, that's at least something. Sweet. So error handling, what are we trying to do? We, uh, the, the first thing we need to do when we do error handling is understand what can go wrong uh, with your code, because if you have no idea what can go wrong, I mean, you can put a try-catch around, uh, around anything, but if you don't know what kind of errors uh, can happen, then uh, might not be the most useful because then you might as well set uh, error action preference to continue and uh, well, silently continue and just keep on uh, keep on going. And also what you want to happen. So uh, we, we've also talked about that. Uh, when, whenever your code fails, what should happen? Should you get an error message? Should it throw? Should you skip, keep on running? Should it try something else? Those are all things that you should uh, keep in mind, but also whenever you're uh, whenever your code fails, also understand uh, what kind of errors it can throw. Because when using try catch, uh, this, the standard catch will just catch anything, but you can also specify a specific uh, error. So if you look at the error message by either using get error or by using uh, uh, by using the error variable, you can uh, you can get. Uh, you can get the specific error, uh, uh, the specific error type, and you can then catch on that. And so, for example, if you're doing any kind of file operation, uh, or any file operation over the network, and there's a network timeout, for example, then you could build in logic in your script where you can catch that. And if that happens, you will just retry, and if it doesn't work three seconds later, retry six seconds later, and if it then doesn't work, then throw an error. Uh, so understanding what is going on is, uh, uh, is important, and also, uh, yeah, scoping the way you catch your errors uh, also, uh, also helps. So there's terminating errors and non-terminating uh, errors. So just because an error is displayed in your terminal, uh, it might not stop your operation. You can, uh, you can also determine that uh, either globally by setting the error action uh, preference to, uh, to a, on a global level, but um, that can also be over, uh, overwritten. Um, let's see, terminating, non-terminating, yep. This one I didn't have. Covered yet? So, yeah, we have the termi terminating, non-terminating uh, errors. Uh, try catch, uh, try catch. Finally, you don't have to use all of them. Uh, uh, you can uh, use all of them. Finally, you can usually do cleanup actions for anything that you've collected or executed uh, in there. You have the error uh, variable. You can also uh, you can also clear this one. One of the things you can do for uh, most of the PowerShell uh, commandlets is you can uh, spec specify error variable, so you can make a specific error variable. So one of the things that uh, 
that I've used it uh, for in the past. If I, uh, if I wanted to uh, quickly know which folders I didn't have access to, I could do a recurse get child item, do a specific uh, adder variable, and then just record in that adder variable all the paths I didn't have access to because uh, I, I wasn't privileged there. So then I knew that if I was doing a file, a file server migration, I could quickly get an overview of the paths that a specific user, if I would run it in a specific context, didn't have access to. And then based on that, I could do either reporting or take immediate, uh, immediate action. So be aware that you can use custom, uh, custom error, error variables for that uh, purpose. I've uh, already, yep. Yes. Yeah. So the question was, does it depend? Yeah. So if you do a get child item, uh, if there's um, if there's ten thousand files or folders, and you have ten thousand files or folders in that specific one. Another way you can do that if there's no error variable available. I have to stop soon. <laughs> but it it's been good. <laughs> um, uh, another thing you can do, uh, but it's more of a brute, uh, brute force way, you can reset the, the error variable. You can do error.clear, uh, use that, uh, use that .net method, then, uh, and then record it or s save it to a new, uh, new variable after your command is done, uh, done running. But error variable is a cleaner way of uh, doing that. Uh, already mentioned all the different uh, preferences that are available. So confirm, debug, Error action preference is uh, is the obvious one. Um, the one that is missing here was the error. Uh, what was that one called again? The error. How concise the uh, errors were. What was it? Error view. Error view. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you. And you can control the kind of output that uh, that you get. What if preference is also uh, is also nice if you're doing something potentially. Uh, potentially damaging, then you can set what if. The challenge with using what if is that uh, if you expect a command to, uh, to not execute anything when what if is called, and it does actually execute, it can still potentially be destructive. So I'm still, still hesitant with that. That's also why I refrained from using, uh, using the remove item uh, script before, because uh, it's, it's my own box. I'm not going to destroy that one. But if I can borrow yours, I'll gladly show it. <laughs> some of the other, uh, some of the other uh, uh, options that we have is we have uh, dollar question mark. Anyone know what that one does? Of course you do. <laughs> Tell me. Tell Yeah, it's uh, it's an indeed an old-fashioned way. I'll uh, I'll show what it does. So we do get item. This one is right. So this one, no, no, that doesn't work at all. So now if we check this one, you can see ah no. So it's false. What this means is the last execution was not okay. If we do it again, oh, it's true. <laughs> so if it doesn't work, just do it again. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason it's true the second time is because the next execution was executing dollar question mark, and because that one was successful, it was now true. Things, uh, things to keep in mind. There's also last exit code. So that one's uh, zero now. Not sure what it would do with this one. Yeah, because this is not uh, this is a PowerShell command set, so. Last exit code doesn't work there. Last exit code is something mostly used for external uh, applications. Um, uh, external applications can throw uh, uh, can throw uh, exit codes, and you can do uh, you can base your behavior based on that. You have uh, error action uh, that you can specify an error variable. Also already mentioned that. Then if you want to tie into that uh, into Go, going deeper, you can use set PSD bug, 
uh, wait for the debugger, PS breakpoints. This one is duplicate. And then what you actually really want to do if you're doing any kind of troubleshooting and debugging, mention it at the start as well. Just use VS Code because it's all integrated there. So with that out of the way, I'm not going to make James more upset because he already came in. Just the questions. Uh, we skipped over the questions. And uh, here's the link for the review. Uh, we have three minutes left. If you have any other questions, I'll still uh, be around here. Please fill, fill out the form. Enjoy uh, the rest of the conference. Lunch will be served in, uh, in three minutes. And uh, yeah, thanks for the interaction. I enjoyed it.